In this video, I'm going to show you how to use SOLIDWORKS CAM to create the G-code necessary to machine the base part of the 3D printer. Here's a simulation of all the tool paths so you have a big picture of what's going on. You can see that it's going to drill the holes with different size drill bits and it's going to start machining the pockets on the corners. And once it's machined the pockets, you can see that it's going to machine this center piece, and it's going to do it in two passes. It's plastic, so we don't need to do any more than two passes. It's an eight-step process to get everything set up using SOLIDWORKS CAM so that we can create the G-code necessary to run the CNC mill. And I'll take you through these eight steps in more detail throughout this video. But here are the steps in summary. First, you'll need to define the tool crib that you're using. Then we need to define the machine, and then define the stock. Then we need to define the coordinate system. Then we need to extract all the machinable features of the part that we're going to be machining. Once we've extracted the machinable features, we need to generate and adjust the operation plan. After that's all adjusted, then we can generate and simulate the tool paths. Once we've got the tool paths all figured out the way we like, then we can post-process to obtain the G-code which is just a text file that we can save to a USB drive and take to the CNC mill in the Maker Lab. So now let's talk about each step in more detail, defining the tool crib. In the Maker Lab, I have set up these three tools that we'll use to machine the base of the 3D printer. Tool 11 is an 8th inch diameter drill bit. Tool 12 is a number 20 drill bit, which is a .161 inch diameter. And tool 13 is a quarter inch flat end mill. Let me demonstrate how to set up this tool crib in SOLIDWORKS. You'll need this new tab right here, SOLIDWORKS CAM. If you're not showing the tab, you can come up here to this drop-down near the options and select add-ins. Then you can make sure that you have activated the SOLIDWORKS CAM add-in. If you click here, it will activate right now. And if you click over here, it will activate any time you start up SOLIDWORKS in the future. Once you've enabled the add-in, then you can just right-click in these tool tabs and you should be able to see the SOLIDWORKS CAM tool tab that you can turn on. When I click on this SOLIDWORKS CAM tool tab, you'll see that mine is laid out a little bit differently than yours. I've got all of my tools just listed under this drop-down. Your tools are probably spaced across this bar here. And if you notice on this far end, you probably have a double set of arrows, which means there's more tools available. So don't forget that some of the tools may be in that expanded tool tab. It's also important to note that many of the SOLIDWORKS CAM tools are also available under this pull-down menu, Tools, select SOLIDWORKS CAM, and many of those options are also available here. We need to go and find the technology database. In this technology database, we can set up all kinds of rules for our machining. We can also set up the tool crib. You can see this area over here, tool crib. Let's just click on this tool crib number one that's empty for now. We're not going to define anything for tool crib number one right now. We're just going to create a brand new tool crib. Let's put in a name for it, ME280 tool crib, and hit this check mark. Now we're working within this new custom tool crib that we're creating. Once we're in this tool crib, now we can start to add some tools. Let's add a drill first. And there's a whole list of drills that are in the library, the SOLIDWORKS library. Let's filter, show the filter. And under the tool ID, let's find something with an eighth inch. There it is right there, eighth inch drill bit, and we'll select that tool. Now that puts in the eighth inch drill bit into our tool crib, but we need to now change the station number. We're going to call this tool 11 and hit save. Let's add another tool. It's another drill. Let's filter again, show the filters, and within the tool ID, this one is actually a number 20 size drill bit. So we'll pick this one right here, select it. Now it's added to our tool crib. We need to give it a station number. This is tool 12, so we'll save that. Now let's add one more tool. This time it's a flat end mill that we're going to be adding. Let's turn on the filters again, and we'll filter for a quarter inch. And We'll use this one right here. We'll select it. Now we'll give it a station number. This is tool 13, and we'll save that. So now we have our tool crib set up. Now we're ready for step number two, where we'll be defining the machine that we're going to be using to actually mill our part. The Maker Lab has this Haas tool room mill. It's a three-axis CNC mill. So we're going to be setting up in SOLIDWORKS a machine that could simulate this one. Once we're in SOLIDWORKS, these three tabs right here are the CAM tabs. 
this first one shows that we have a machine that we can set up. If you don't have that, you can come up to this toolbar and define a machine. But usually there's already one predefined by default. Let's right click and edit the definition. Within this first tab, we can pick what kind of machine that we have available to us. Ours is a three axis CNC mill, so we'll pick this one here, mill inch. We select that. Then we go to the tool crib and we want to define which tool crib we're going to use with this machine. In our case, I'm going to pick the ME280 tool crib that we've just created. I'll select it. And then I'm also going to make sure that I check this checkbox right here to use this tool crib only. That way it won't try and reach out automatically to other tool cribs to find tools. Because these tools that I've set up in the ME280 tool crib really are the only tools we have available to us there in the Maker Lab. In this tab for post processor, we want to indicate that it's a Haas CNC mill so that it will create G code for the Haas. So let's scroll down, and here is the mill, which is a Haas of VF3. And then the rest of these tabs, we can just accept the default. Choose OK. Now we've defined the machine. Next, we're ready for step three, where we'll define the stock. Stock is the material size before it's machined. This is a graphic of the part after it's machined. And you can see overall it's a 10 and a half inch square part that's three quarters of an inch thick. We're not going to be machining around the outside perimeter of the part. And we're not going to be facing the part down to a different thickness either. So our raw material before machining is going to be 10 and a half inch square by three quarters thick as well. So now that I'm in SolidWorks, I'm going to go here to this stock manager. And if you're not seeing that, you can always go up here to the tool and to find some stock right here, stock manager. For me, I'll just right click and edit the definition. This is where I define the stock. First of all, we're going to pick some material and we're going to be machining this out of high density polyethylene. But that didn't really exist in SolidWorks library. But nylon is a plastic that machines very similar to high density polyethylene. So I'm going to choose nylon. That way all the parameters that are in the library for nylon, they'll work for high density polyethylene as well for the machining speeds and feeds. Then for the stock material, we can have SolidWorks automatically look at our part and define some stock for us. Right now I'm choosing this, a bounding box. It'll create a bounding box around our part and I could add some offsets. In other words, I could add some extra material. Here I'm just choosing zero because we don't want to add any extra material around the outside of this part. We'll choose OK. We have now defined our stock. Now we're ready for step four where we can define the machining coordinate system. This graphic right here shows how we're going to hold the part on the Haas mill while we're machining it. You can see that we have a fixture plate, and that's in the Maker Lab, mounted to the Haas machine. We'll place the stock on the fixture plate and push it up against these alignment pins. Once it's pushed up against the alignment pins, we'll tighten down the clamps to hold it in place. Now, because those alignment pins are along the left side and the bottom edge, this is what we've defined on the machine as the origin. And as is typical for any CNC milling machine, the X direction is to the right, the positive Y direction is away from you, and the positive Z direction is upward. So in SOLIDWORKS, we're going to define this bottom left corner as our origin. You can see right here by default we have a coordinate system set up. If you don't have one, you can go here and select to define a coordinate system. For me, I'll just right click on this one and edit the definition. Now right here, I can define using an entity where the origin will be, and I'll just pick this bottom corner point for my origin. Now for the x-axis, I can indicate this edge to be the x-axis. For the y-axis, I'll indicate this edge to be the y-axis. And it looks like I need to reverse the direction of the y-axis. Now you can see that I have the x, y, and z axis set up in the correct directions. And I'll choose OK. Now we're ready for step number five, where we can extract machinable features from our CAD model. SolidWorks CAM has the intelligence to extract machinable features from your 3D model. I'll just go to the CAM, the SOLIDWORKS CAM tab and select Extract Machinable Features. You'll notice that it automatically recognized some irregular slots, some ir irregular pockets, some holes, and this countersink hole group right here. And it placed this one in a mill part setup separate from the rest of these. That's because it was smart enough to realize that if these are countersunk holes, I'll need to machine them from the opposite side of the part to where I'm machining all the rest. But in real life, I'm going to machine these holes from the top, and I'm just going to countersink them later by hand with a DeWalt hand drill. 
So I'm going to take this countersunk whole group and I'm going to drag it up into this area and I'm just going to delete this other mill part setup so that I can machine everything from the top side. Now we're ready for step number six where we will generate and adjust an operation plan. Now that I have all of these machinable features extracted, I'll let SolidWorks create an operation plan. I right click on the mill part setup, I can select to generate an operation plan. This operation plan is generated based off of rules that are set up in the SolidWorks technology database. And we can go in and change some of those rules if we'd like. But for this case, we'll just accept the default rules. You'll notice that it creates this operation plan here in this second CAM tab within the feature manager. And you'll also notice that there are two of the machinable features that didn't get included. If I go back to this tab here that shows the machinable features, you'll see that these two are listed in blue. That means that SolidWorks ignored those machinable features because there was a rule in the SolidWorks technology database that caused that to happen. This whole group number two and the countersink whole group number five are quarter inch in diameter. And the only tool we had set up in the ME280 tool crib was a quarter inch diameter flat end mill. And within the default SolidWorks rules, it's set up to not allow drilling with an end mill. But because we're using plastic, we will be just fine doing a plunge drilling operation with a flat end mill. If we were doing aluminum or steel, we certainly wouldn't want to do that. But with plastic, we're just fine. So what we're going to have to do within this second SolidWorks tab that shows our operation plan, we're going to need to create a custom operation to drill those machinable features that SolidWorks had ignored. So within the SolidWorks CAM tab, I'm going to manually add some whole machining operations. You'll notice these three tabs here, they allow me to define which operation I want to use, which tool I want to use, and which features I want to machine with that tool. So here in the operation, I'm going to choose a drilling operation. Then within the tool tab, I'm going to select to use tool 13, a flat end mill. And within the features tab, I'm going to select to do hole group number two and the countersink hole group number five to drill all five of those holes with this quarter inch end mill. And I'll select OK. Now it opens up this operation parameters window where I could specify some additional operation parameters. I'll just accept the default here, noticing that yes, it is using this quarter inch end mill. Choose OK. Now we can see that we do have these two drilling operations that are now using tool 13, the quarter inch flat end mill. We're still going to need to adjust this operation plan a little bit because I'm noticing that there are two rough milling operations and a contour milling operation for each of these pockets. We certainly don't need two rough milling operations. So I'm going to take this one, this one, and this one, and I'll just right click and delete those. You'll notice when I delete something, it puts it down here in the recycle bin, so I can always recover it later. If I right click and empty the recycle bin, then it'll get rid of those for good. I'm also noticing that for this center section right here, it's got two rough milling operations and a contour milling operation for the top section that has these slots and two rough milling and a contour milling operation for the bottom section where the slots don't exist. The rough milling is basically going to go back and forth and machine this entire center section, turning it all to chips, and there's no sense doing that. So I'm going to get rid of these rough milling operations as well. Right click and select delete. I can also reorder these operation plans so that it's going to do it in a more intuitive order. I think it'll be more intuitive if we do all the machining with tool number 11 first, then we move to tool number 12 next, then finally we do all the machining with tool number 13. So I'm going to take this one right here, drill operation number 1 with tool 11. I'm going to drag that to the top, so we do that first. Then I'll take this drill 2 operation with using tool 12 and drag that next. Then I'll take this drilling operation with tool 13 and drag it next. Then this drilling operation also with tool 13, drag it next. Now we're ready for step number seven where we can generate actual tool paths and then simulate them to make sure everything's being machined correctly. Once we have all the operations the way we want them, we can now just right click and generate the tool path for those operations. And now that the tool path is set up, I can right click and simulate that tool path. In the display options area of this window, I like to change the display of the stock so that it's showing shaded with edges. And I also like to change the display of the tool so it's showing shaded with edges and then I'll speed up the simulation. When I hit play, I can see the simulation and I can watch how it's going to be machining these parts.
As I was watching this, I noticed that in these contour milling operations around this perimeter, it did too many passes. I'm machining plastic. Really all I need to do is one pass that does these slots, and then another pass that finishes off this center section. So within this contour milling operation, let's edit that definition. And if I go to the contour tab, you can see here the depth parameters that the first cut and the maximum cut will be 50%, and that's a percentage of the tool diameter. So I'm going to change those to 300%. I can actually go 300% of the tool diameter. It'll be bound by the actual depth of these slots, but at least I'm telling it that I will allow it to go up to 300% of the tool diameter per pass. I'll need to make that same change here in this contour milling operation. Go to the contour tab, change that to a 300% of the tool diameter allowable for the depth. Now when I simulate this tool path, it does that center section in only two passes. The first pass includes these slots, the second pass does the rest of the center section. The final step is number eight where we post process those tool paths to obtain G-code. Now that I have my tool paths created, I'm ready to create G-code, which is simply a text file that I can put on a flash drive and bring over to the CNC mill in the Maker Lab. If I right click on the mill part setup, I can select post process these tool paths. I'm going to save it just as a text file. You could have any kind of ending to the file type, but just know that it really is just a text file, so why not save it as a text file? I'm going to save this to my desktop, and then it brings up this window. If I hit play, it will now post-process each toolpath one at a time, creating G-code. We'll select OK here. Now I'm going to go to the desktop, and you'll see right here, here's the file that was just created. I'm going to right-click and say Open With. I could open with Notepad, with Microsoft Word, whatever. Let's open it with Notepad. It's just a text file, and this is all the G-code. This is what will control the CNC mill. This is what would go on a USB drive that could be taken to a CNC milling machine.